Thank you for joining us today on Ed Far. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Weather-related disasters have increased fivefold in the last 50 years. Humanity and especially vulnerable communities are only starting to adapt to the new reality of weather extremes. Despite there now being widespread consensus that nature-based solutions need to be considered in adaptation planning, their potential is still largely untapped. So where are we now and what solutions do we have? The Glasgow Leaders' Declaration on Forest and Land Use, which was adopted at COP26, is one. But how far can it help? So then we look at this, but we start from northern Mali, where people are daily witnessing the horror of global warming. Do stay with us. Since Lake Fagubin in northern Mali dried up, communities on its parched shores have had to defend their homes from encroaching sand dunes while finding new ways to scratch a living from the degraded soil. The lake, once one of the largest in West Africa, used to be fed by annual flooding from the Niger River, but it started to disappear after a catastrophic drought in the 1970s, forcing more than 200,000 people to abandon their traditional livelihoods. Farmer turned herder Abdul Karim Ag Alassan and other inhabitants of the formerly lakeside villages west of Timbuktu have to build barriers out of sticks in an effort to keep the dunes at bay. All this area was covered by water. Then the water receded and trees started to grow around the lake. Then the trees started to disappear and people grew crops where the trees used to be. During the first rebellion, displaced persons arrived. They destroyed the forest. And once the forest was gone, the sand dunes formed. Abdul Karim and other herders now have to walk long distances to find water for their livestock. I prefer arable to livestock farming. You don't have much in the way of expenses. You grow crops and you harvest them. Animals are much more tiring. You have to move them around, water them, buy feed, and run around after them day and night. Maize farmer Muhammad Husman said tensions are high between livestock herders and other farmers over the little fertile land and water available. He said the regular disputes have led to rising levels of crime. After we've harvested our produce, we have to transport it, and that's dangerous. Even the women you see behind me are at risk. Their maize may be stolen on the way. The shrinking population of Lake Fagubin is set to come under further pressure from climate change. Average temperatures are expected to rise over 3 degrees Celsius in West Africa by 2100 and up to 4.7 degrees Celsius in northern Mali, according to the United Nations climate body. Residents in the area report that since the water disappeared, Flammable gas has been escaping from cracks in the dry earth. Musa Muhammad Tori, a former farmer, said the gas ignites often. There was a big forest here. Before that, there was the lake where we used to grow our crops. The forest grew following the drought, and after the forest came the gas. The gas has eaten up all the trees we had. Musa also said the lack of economic activities has forced many young people to leave home. Hello, I have a bus. I have a chicken. His family survives on what his son, Muhammad, sends from home from the capital, Bamako. The village is only functioning thanks to our brave children who've gone away. 50 to 60 percent of the population has left. Apart from supporting his own family, Muhammadu and his wife have taken in children from the Lake Fagubin region so they can study and hopefully build a better life for themselves. Je suis venu à Bamako parce que nous nos parents vivaient avant avec l'agriculture. I came to Bamako 
Because before, our parents were farmers, but there was drought all through our childhood. As soon as we were old enough, we had to move here to earn money and send something to our families so they could eat. The young men of my generation are here with their wives. Those of us who are living here divide what we earn between ourselves and our families in the north. In the village of Bintangungu, the advancing dunes have buried a schoolyard and cracked the empty building's foundations. This is a school for almost 400 students, 400 students. That's an entire generation, a lost generation, a generation condemned to flee or be recruited. The biggest investment that's needed is not to distribute aid to people. What is needed is to try and identify the cause of the problem and resolve it. That means stabilizing the dunes so as to immediately halt the erosion and fill the lake with water again so that people can earn a living. If you look at those parts of Lake Fagubin, where there is still water, you will see some wonderful livestock. Effort to boost resilience by restoring Fagubin's wetlands and the area's role as the breadbasket of the Timbuktu region have been derailed by waves of conflict. Most recently, a years-long Islamic insurgency, according to a 2016 study in the African Journal of Aquatic Science. Nature and how to protect it took center stage during the first week of COP26 as the United Nations Climate Conference turns its focus on the natural world and biodiversity loss. In 2020, the leaders of 92 countries pledged to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030 and try to save some, if not all, of the one million species currently at risk of extinction. The COP26 summit in the Scottish city of Glasgow sought to raise enough commitment from world leaders to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That will require the world to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. More than 100 global leaders have pledged to halt and reverse deforestation and land degradation by the end of the decade. Representing over 85% of the world's forest estate, they've made a landmark commitment to work together to halt and reverse deforestation and land degradation by 2030. Not just halt, but reverse. And that means more leaders than ever before have now signed up to protect our forests. Underpinned by $19 billion in public and private funds to invest in protecting and restoring forests, the promise made in a joint statement issued on Monday the 1st of November was backed by leaders of countries including Brazil, Indonesia and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which collectively account for 85% of the world's forests. The leaders' declaration included $12 billion in public funding to support work to protect, restore and sustainably manage forests from 12 countries to be delivered over 2021 to 2025. $7.2 billion in private investment from corporate and philanthropic funds. Of that, $19.2 billion, at least $1.5 billion, earmarked specifically for protecting the forests of Africa's Congo Basin. Of that, $19.2 billion, at least $1.7 billion, pledged towards supporting indigenous peoples and local communities and advancing their land tenure rights and a commitment from the chief executives of more than 30 financial institutions to divest from activities linked to commodity-driven deforestation. We could not have come at a better time than now, uh, more importantly for Africa, who is uh, contributing less to the climate issues, who is suffering more on these issues, and also having the backlash of uh, multiple issues like uh, illegal uh, foreign deforestation of our continent. Uh, and I think this will practically address that. Uh, it then means uh, the scientists 
which is our prayer body on the good business, we have to enforce some law uh, to prevent uh, further encroachment into African uh, uh, contiguous forests. Uh, I think so it's a welcome uh, development that the, the world powerful leaders are saying enough is enough and we should start uh, one allowing regeneration of our forest as well as uh, expanding the planting uh, coverage of our but many people believe there is no pathway to net zero without protecting and restoring the natural ecosystems that protect us, like healthy forests which clean the air or mangroves that defend coastlines against storm surges. By increasingly, nature is considered a, a, the foundation for a healthy economy, healthy society, for our, our own health as COVID-19 pandemic has, has shown. And, and, and as a major solution to climate. So that's increasing the way we value nature, and that was missing until recently. So that's a really important legacy, I think, of COP26. In Nigeria, part of the federal government's response to impact of climate change is to plant more trees. Many of the country's states, too, are planting trees for their environmental benefit. Most states in the northern part of the country have the target of preventing further desertification. Southern states have a range of targets, such as controlling erosion. According to a United Nations Development Program report, in Nigeria every year, 13 million hectares of forests are lost, while 3.6 billion hectares suffers desertification affecting mostly poor communities. You know that uh, our, the target or the expected minimum target of every country is 25 percent. We are not even near 10 percent as I speak. So we need to uh, be aggressive and uh, open up. And but who, who, is who is monitoring? Who is monitoring? Nobody is monitoring. Who are monitoring? One, you should know that my agency is the agency of power to tell what coverage does Nigeria have through our non detriment findings. So I'm the one that can tell you what percentage of Nigerian uh, landscape is covered with trees. People are mistaking uh, forestry cover or tree cover from vegetative coverage. Grass can be a coverage, but grass cannot be there for, for 365 days. It has off season and it's off season. But when we're saying tree covers, we're talking about the perennial cover mm -hmm. of the land. So I'm the only authority that can tell you what percentage of the general land or landscape is covered with trees. Meanwhile, President Muhammad Buhari promised in 2019 that 25 million trees will be planted annually in Nigeria to enhance the carbon sink and combat climate change. To achieve the target, the federal government is engaging both national and international organizations. It's not about the fundamental environment that this agency is planting. It's about who owns the land, what time do we plant, who protects what we plant, and who assures the security of what we plant. Protecting it in the, in, the, in the sense of nurturing it to grow and securing it as the community where they are growing. And the most uh, important stakeholder to engage is the Nigerian government. Well. I don't want to go into our strategies, the Nigerian government. Well. Why? The federal government has limited time. The, the state government has the land. If lands are not seeded for this project, and not only seeded, documentedly seeded, that this land has been dedicated for this. We're not saying hand over this land to federal, but there must be an MOU between the federal and the state saying this land has been given to federal so government for this purpose and for as long as the tree remains on it. The fundamental environment is not interested in the fruit of the trees, no. Nigeria is currently planting below 4% as against the 25% recommendation of forest cover by Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Forest loss and damage is the cause of around 
10% of global warming. This, in turn, poses danger against the fight against climate crisis if deforestation continues. With its oil reserves in decline, Gabon is betting that careful logging can safeguard the vast wealth of its forests. Having carbon emissions associated with the industry by producing more timber. How Central African countries like Gabon manage their share of the world's second largest rainforest is critical. The so-called lungs of Africa store more carbon per hectare than the Amazon help regulate temperatures and generate rain for millions in the arid Sahel and distant Ethiopian highlands. It's heart-wrenching because we're destroying part of the environment in a way. But what else can we do? We got it down because we're asked to. We have to cut this tree, get it out and sell it so we can make a living. Gabon faces a conundrum. Its relatively untouched share of the Congo Basin rainforest makes it one of the world's most forested countries. A haven for endangered animals and one of the few net absorbers of climate warming carbon. But with the oil industry that foils 45% of its economy facing decline, self styled Green Gabon wants to ramp up other industries while maintaining its forest cover above 85 percent. Forest Minister Lee White believes logging is part of the solution. He says common conscious felling, stiffer regulation and more local wood processing will generate value from the forest while minimizing environmental damage. Mr. White, a biologist and former Wildlife Conservation Society officer, said halting industrial logging, as some environmentalists wish, was not realistic. Let them come here and show me how to manage the forest and how to create jobs for the Gabonese people and how to replace the oil economy that we're going to lose because developed countries have polluted the atmosphere so nobody's going to buy our oil anymore. Um, let them show me how I replace $12 billion worth of oil revenues without cutting a tree down. Um, we have developed this, this, this economic model whereby we're doing sustainable forestry. We, cut, you know, we might cut this one tree here in this hectare. We cut one to two trees per hectare and then we leave the forest alone for 25 years to regrow. Every morning, trucks piled with trees enter Gabon's special economic zone, the epicenter of its value-added timber ambitions. After a 2009 ban on unprocessed log exports, the wood's legal credentials are checked before it is taxed for processing. There has to be a fair deal for Gabon. Um, um, and we believe the fair deal does involve sustainable forestry. Human beings have used wood for hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. Uh, if you do it right, you keep the forest. If you do it wrong, you lose the forest. Um, and so we're trying to do it right. And we are determined to maintain our forest cover and maintain these ecosystem services. But we have to create jobs and livelihoods for the young people of Gabon. Some trunks are turned into plywood sheets, others into high-end furniture. Instead of the $200 per cubic meter Gabon once earned from raw wood export, plywood fetches $500 and furniture up to $3,000. But the extra processing has created 8,000 new jobs. The same quantity of wood than we used to cut 10 years back. The difference is we have a lot of value added by doing the industrialization locally. So we can give, we can get maybe five times what we use to get by doing the local transformation of the wood and creating also a lot of jobs for 
nationals, people, of course, yeah. The means of limiting emissions promoted by the Nature Conservancy is part of Gabon's forest plan. Reduced impact logging for climate mitigation can lower emissions by minimizing collateral damage from tree felling, according to a 2019 study in the journal Forest Ecology and Management. This means making sure concessions track their carbon impact, build narrower roads, fell trees to cause least damage, and use less destructive equipment. With the Nature Conservancy, Gabon has tested reduced impact logging for climate mitigation and plans a nationwide rollout that it forecasts will help cut logging emissions by 50% by 2030 and maintain low deforestation even as timber production grows 20%. To ensure logging firms stick to the rules, Gabon has been advised that it must monitor its forests closely and not rely on outside auditors like the Forest Stewardship Council. Democratic Republic of Congo, with the largest share of Congo Basin rainforest, demonstrates the risk of poor management. It lost nearly 500,000 hectares of primary rainforest in 2020, second only to Brazil, according to Global Forest Watch. Gamos Forestry Minister wants to show that the country is serious about tackling illegal logging which before he was appointed in 2019, accounted for nearly 40% of the $800 million timber industry. His predecessor was fired over a scandal involving hundreds of missing containers of protected Kevazingo wood. Unfortunately, we have some baggage, we have some history. We've, 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 we've done better than most nations, but we have had problems with illegal forestry. And so over the next five or ten years, no matter how good we are, people are always going to have a question mark, always ask. And, and so we are doing all we can to improve our forest management. And, and we're going to, it's going to become very difficult to move a log in Gabon without the forest department knowing about it and therefore to do it illegally. Experts say one of the great developments of COP26 has been the strongest ever commitment to halt deforestation, which was launched during the first week of the summit. With almost 90% of the forest countries adhering to that and committing to really embrace deforestation-free supply chains for many commodities that are used around the world. Currently, only 3% of global climate finance is spent on nature-based solutions and only 1% for climate adaptation and governments are being urged to make ambitious commitments to build nature-positive economies and societies. Researchers say if nature-based solutions were done appropriately, they could provide 30 to 40 percent of the carbon dioxide reductions required by 2030. But these approaches should not take away from the need to stop burning fossil fuels. One of the Glasgow leaders' declaration on forest and land use, which was adopted at COP26 to end and reverse deforestation by 2030, is a much welcome step. Experts say there is a need to go beyond forests and look also, for example, at grasslands, peatlands, marshes, and marine ecosystems, all of which build on the rich diversity of ecosystems for adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and biodiversity. We've also been told that while nature-based solutions win both in science and on the ground, they can only fully develop their full potential if they are designed as integrated solutions and in combination with other safety nets. For example, climate risk insurance or forecast-based financing. Over the long term, the planting or protecting forests can only be an effective climate adaptation measure if this gets complemented by actions that also relieve the environmental and social pressures which led to their destruction in the first place. That's our program for today. Thank you for watching. We hope to be back with you next week. In the meantime, our inbox at file at channelcv.com is available for your comments and your questions. From all of us here in Lagos, it's bye for now.